this happened and part of accepting it part of i think it probably falls under surrender too is being like i don't have to be okay with the fact that it happened i have to be able to accept that it did happen it's in the past i can't change that it happened and also recognizing like it's not a reflection of me and i struggle with that a lot to really internalize like this person did this or this person said that whatever it may be this has happened and it doesn't mean anything about me but the pain is mine and i have to be able to sit and hold the pain and yeah it's really uncomfortable welcome to whole and unleashed a podcast about coming home to ourselves i'm your host jessica Locke a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? We all hear about or have personally been through the dark night of the soul. And while it is way more than one night, it is often an expression to an awakening that we experience, a rebirth. And it can be very painful, liberating at times, mixed with a lot of emotions and things coming up to the surface to be confronted and processed. The big question is, what happens after these big realizations come up? How do we move through that? Do we upend our lives, change our identities and start over? Do we move to another country? Do we cut all the bonds we've made? And more than often, there are a lot more questions than actual answers. Because it's such a destabilizing place to be at. It's like the floor has been ripped out from under. And yes, we also get to the other side where we experience more alignment and ease. But to get there requires some tender recalibration. It is a meeting between where we're currently at and where we want to be. I am so excited to share today's episode. It is an expansion session and our guest is a 6'3 emotional triple split projector. And I'm excited because an expansion session is a coaching session. And this time we've incorporated some tidbits of her human design. And it's the first time I've done so in this kind of context and in a place that I can share with you. It was so fascinating to hear their points of tension, like some of her energies as a triple split. She has a defined crown and mind, and there's a lot of energy that's constantly trying to chew on something, reflect on things, while she also has an emotion authority. So our emotions is not something that we can really make sense of, especially as we're going through it. And, you know, feeling that tension of wanting to understand why she was feeling a certain way instead of how can I hold space, let it be without trying to find a reason why. And we talked a little bit as well about her 36, which is uh, the gate of crisis, that energy of feeling crisis and almost chaos. And it's this beautiful energy that can give us a lot of insight, but not during. And how often do we as human beings judge what we're feeling or even associate certain feelings with good or bad? And we do it at such an unconscious level. And in their case, they felt like, oh, I must be taking the wrong decision, taking the wrong step if I'm feeling all this up and down and all the crisis around it, when in reality, that's just part of her design. How can she learn to hold on to that tension, to feeling the up, the downs, even the crisis at times, and see what insights come of them later on? And we also talked about identity, belonging. Our guest is an adoptee. So a lot of stories that she's been holding on to for a very long time and being confronted with them right now. There's so much deaf, beautiful realizations in this conversation. And without further ado, let me start the episode. Oh, 
welcome, welcome. So I guess, what are you holding right now? What was the motivation behind your pull to sign up for an expansion session? Yeah, there's so much. It's like, where to begin? Um, I guess you, this year has been wild for me. Like 2022 has just been unfolding so quickly and rapidly. And I feel like things are happening um, at a rate faster than I can even keep up with, um, especially because with COVID and lockdown and everything, things were just really, really slow. So comparatively, things were really, really fast. Um, but I guess, I'm like, how far back do I go? But I moved to Korea in 2020 um, and I, I'm adopted. So I didn't grow up with any connection to my Korean ancestry. And I knew I was at a point in my life where that was really important. And that is something that I needed to do. And so I moved in September of 2020. And mm -hmm. then I was taking language lessons, but everything had been online. And I was going through kind of like my dark night of the soul. So it was good because I didn't know anyone here. So there was no pressure to like go out or have to maintain relationships or anything. Um, so I could kind of really go inwards because I needed that. Um, and then... Yeah, the, the beginning of this year is finishing up, I guess, the winter semester. And then I just had the feeling of like, I don't want to do another semester of online classes, but I also don't want to sit in my apartment for three months and not doing anything, mm -hmm. do anything. And then it aligned so quickly, but I ended up, I lived in South Africa from 2017 to 2019. So I ended up going back and doing a yoga teacher training there. I had a friend that I had met at a silent retreat and she now teaches at the studio, but she had also done the training. And I remember she had said how transformative it was for her. Um, and I went and it was such a positive experience to, I'd actually done one previously that didn't really meet my needs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was really affirming to like have um, the desire to go and to go and kind of like do that for myself and for it to be so powerful and for it to really feel like it was in alignment. Um, and then I was there for three months. So I was there from March until the end of May. And then I came back to Korea and I was having a really hard time. So that's when I reached out uh, about the expansion session. And I'd also like found, I'd heard human design previously and I had studied design in grad school for a bit. So I was like, oh, what's that? And I was like, oh, that's not what I thought it was. And I just- That's what like, I thought as well. I thought it was okay. related to design. I'm like, oh, I don't think I need to more design things right now. But then I realized it's completely different. Yeah, like the name is like a little bit misleading. And so the first time I heard, I was like, oh, okay, it's not what I thought. And I just kind of let it go. And then I don't know why, but I just um, started poking around and getting into it. And it's it's a lot. And then like found gene keys and all of these other things. And I was like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also... I found some of it to really resonate and that was really helpful, especially um, through my yoga teacher training, recognizing that um, because I was relinquished as a baby, like my root chakra and that sense of like, am I safe? Can I trust myself? Can I trust the world? Like I really struggle with that um, and with just feelings of like safety and security. And my response to that when my nervous system's dysregulated is to go into hyper arousal. So I'm like, how can I fix it? What can I do? Like running around, like I'm like such a doer um, and reading. And yeah, and I feel like it often is like me spinning my wheels or just like opening a million tabs <laughs> in my browser, but like not. Yeah, and not actually doing anything. And so re reading about being a projector and the idea of like waiting for an invitation, even now I'm like, oh, it's so hard like to relinquish that control. And surrender has also been a big thing that I've been trying to understand <laughs> as someone who like my inclination is to do and to like really like white knuckle things to learn like how to surrender, how to ask, even recognizing in a moment that like I can ask feels like a form of surrender um and yeah just the idea I think the thing that resonated with me most that really like drew me into human design was just this idea of like waiting for an invitation mm -hmm. and for that to be kind of a way to move more in alignment with the universe um 
But yeah, so before I left for South Africa, I didn't know if Korea would be forever. Mm -hmm. And then once I was there, I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm surrounded by people who are speaking English so I can understand what they're saying. And I feel like I just, there was so much more opportunity for connection. And, you know, when I was going through that period, and I do think I'm more introverted than I previously thought, but I also, I enjoy people and I enjoy connecting with people. And so I just realized like Korea is not forever. Like my life doesn't live here. I don't know Mm -hmm. where it lives necessarily. (laughs) Um, But I think that's also part of it too, is like, you know, before I left, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this training, but I don't know if this is forever. And then I came Mm -hmm. back feeling like, okay, this isn't forever, but it is for now. And I still feel like there's some things I need to process and be here for now. Um, But yeah, it's like a big, big question mark of Mm -hmm. what is this thing that I'm, what is my purpose in life? What is my dharma? What is no biggie? Yeah. Supposed to do. And, um, you know, it's always kind of been something that's like, I'm gnawing on in the back of my head, but now, especially Mm -hmm. thinking about leaving, it's like, it would be so nice to have some type of um, guidance in terms of like figuring, even figuring out how to figure out, you know, like, right, right, right. It's almost like, you know, what's sort of not working. So how do I find something that works? And there's a million possibilities out there. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. And I was going to touch on human design later, but since you brought it up, do you know, how much do you know about human design and about your profile, for example? Not, I, I, I feel like I should err on the side of it. Like, <laughs> <not, not. laughs> like I've read a lot, but I, I don't fully always understand. And I also have really only read about my own profile. Of so course. I think sometimes it makes like contrast to be like, oh, well, if this is, but this is how other people work. So I would say like, I'm very, I'm a novice for sure, but like, I'm very intrigued. And then yeah. when I start getting into gene keys, I was like, okay, I really don't understand anything. Oh, that now. is like a whole, I started reading about it. My brain, it was the same time that I was learning about human design. I was like, oh, I don't think my brain can store more right now. I'm going to put this on pause and then go yeah. down, go deeper. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a lot of information. And the reason I wanted to touch on your profile is because as a six, three, the six goes through three phases in their lives. And knowing that the three is known as the martyr is here to test things, to bump into things. It's basically here to make mistakes, to find out what doesn't work so that it can come with solutions. And as a six, you initially lived your first 30 years as a three as well. So you have a double three, three in your subconscious side, in your body side, and also in your personality side. So, and then, you know, after all that, so the six unlike the three is not as resilient the three is like oh I felt I get back up the six is more like oh I need time so right now I think you're going towards the second phase of your life which is post 30 30 towards like late 40s and 50 and it's more kind of like a a, an aloof energy it wants to kind of like rest and heal from all that learning that it's been doing the first 30 years I don't know if you noticed this subtle difference or this contrast between the first 30 years of your life to now and it's also after your Saturn return too yeah yeah that Saturn return really got me (laughs) um yeah yeah, I mean I feel like I'm just now coming into like really understanding who I am and feeling um there's there's this poem that I had found at one point and when I was going through my dark night of the soul and it was pretty dark it was like um it had like the verbiage was like being in a room where there's like windows and no doors Mm. like feeling like you can see out but you just can't get out um and that's really stuck with me because that's you know there was a lot of despair and a lot of hopelessness and so it really resonated in that way um and I feel like I'm coming into feeling more in the flow of just life and feeling Mm. like oh life can be for me like it's not something that other people have that I don't have access to but I feel very much so at like the precipice of that and there's still a little bit of like trepidation and not fully knowing how to like move into it it. yeah 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 Yeah. and then the other thing that has come up has been I need to go slow because knowing that my body goes into hyper arousal and it's do 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 go 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 etc like the antithesis is that the right word or like the the way to the antidote for that yeah to 
slow down and to really yeah. like actively try and find ways to like right. just sit and to just like hold the pain and to just hold the discomfort and to just be with as opposed to trying to be like oh I feel this pain I need to do something about it to just right kind of like right and it out. it definitely takes time to regulate and that's something I share a lot when I had my burnout I quit my career and I thought I'm out of that environment so I'll be fine I noticed that the anxiety I still carried with me it was how I coped so when I had I was trying to build this other business so I was like well you need to be working more hours you used to be able to do like 12 hours a day why are you not doing that why are you not figuring things out and it's like a lot of pushing because we want to figure it out and it's just so anxiety inducing to go from doing all these things and then not doing anything not knowing what to do yeah. it's almost like I have all this space what the heck do I do with this space now and it's yeah. it, it's kind of like a recalibration process where okay we, we're here now what can we do? And adding to that sixth energy where it's kind of retreating, you're also known as like in the second phase of your life on the roof. This is what they refer as. It's almost like, so to mean? bring, to give this a little bit more context, like the six profiles in human design, people have used like the house analogy to refer to them. So the first is the investigator. And that's the person who is building the foundation of a house. They're studying the materials. They love researching. They want to make sure that the house is standing on a really strong foundation and they just wanted researchers anybody that, had, that has a research background or love researching they likely have the one in their profile um, and then the second one is known as the hermit that's the person who is kind of dancing on top of like the foundation that the first line built and it's in the first floor of the house and you can see it from outside you're walking by this house and you see this person chilling they might be dancing you know they have some very natural skills that they're not aware of and the way their energy moves or gets activated is by people recognizing their skills and they call them like hey I see that you're really good at painting do you want to do this for me and it's up to them to accept the call to see if it's aligned that's the second line energy and the third line the martyr <laughs> I'm like this name sounds not the best. it just sounds overwhelming for anyone who's like I don't want to be a martyr right. it's basically the person who is kind of like Q&A, quality assurance. They're testing the material from the first floor and they're taking it to the second floor. So this is the, the line in the hexagram that's starting to like, how can I prepare this for the second floor? How can I make sure that the materials that we've tried, how can we break this to bring a stronger material? That's finding the problems of what's not working. You're going up and down the stairs. So this is the experiential energy. And then the fourth line is the person that's very similar to the second line that's on the second floor and they're kind of in the balcony they're bringing people together they're looking at other houses they're like oh let's see so and so can help us decorate the house so they're here to bring the opportunities they're here to make things happen connect people the fifth line is again similar to the second line but in a sense that people see them but they project on them so the fifth line receives projections because you're on the second floor. I see you painting or doing some sort of thing. So I make up a story of like, oh, maybe you can do this for me as well. But it's not as clear as a person on the second floor. So you project to them, like maybe you have the solution for me. That's what the projection for the fifth line. And then finally the sixth line is a person that's on top of the roof. It's kind of like, okay, everything's done in the house. I'm just gonna sit here and chill here. It's known as a role model because it's here to kind of embody all of the lessons and insights that the rest of the profiles of the lines have learned and gained. And it's a lot about embodying. But because the sixth line go through three phases, the first phase is like trial and error. That's what it's doing. The second is like the healing phase. That's between 30s to late 40s. And that's kind of where we're a bit more, you mentioned introverted, that you notice that you feel more introverted. That's the energy that kind of wants to sit back a little bit, wants to be sort of detached from the world because just like, oh, I'm exhausted, but also wants to engage. It sees a higher picture. And then from late 40s to like the rest of their lives, that's their third phase that's the final phase which is role model they come down interact with people again then they're here to engage also seen as like a sage or something sort of energy and this is like a really quick breakdown of like no the different pressure. energies <laughs> no pressure no pressure but a big part of the role model energy you have it you have access to it throughout the phases and it's something that people might even notice about you without you know because our energy speaks for itself they might see you model something they're like oh I can probably do that too or you know it's just 
how your energy moves it's not something you have to try and the reason I wanted to bring more into it because like on your second phase a lot of healing is going to come up and perhaps a lot of things that didn't work is also coming into your foresight Hmm. which can be overwhelming and it's really learning about to hold and you mentioned surrender I wanted to ask a little bit more you know the dark night of the soul what were some of the themes that you noticed coming up oh gosh (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so I was I was in Korea and oh sorry about that I was in Korea and um I was on my own and basically so so I was adopted and raised by white parents and a white family and a white community I never saw myself reflected um and had no concept of myself as an Asian woman no concept of what it meant to me to be I knew I wasn't white but I didn't know that I was Asian or that I was Korean like I just had no understanding of what that meant to me no relationship to it um other than shame and then um from where where did the shame come from if you don't mind if you want to expand on that yeah I think being teased so like very explicitly and then I think wanting to fit in and knowing that this thing about me made it so that I didn't fit in and trying so hard all the time to belong Mm. and fit in as well um and yeah and then I I started to gain more of an understanding of my identity when I was living in New York but it was still very nascent at that time and then I moved to South Africa in 2017 and I um, was living in a rural community. It was predominantly Black South Africans. And I was going through this, um, I didn't learn about social justice in, in university. It was two, I graduated in 2012, so I started in 2008. Um, and yeah, I don't think it was, if it was a thing, I missed it. Um, yeah. And so I didn't have any of this language to understand my, to understand experience Mm -hmm. and then in South Africa learning you know language around internalized oppression and microaggressions and all of these things I was like oh I understand that like this completely resonates and then it was really well I'm not white if I'm not white what am I and it Mm -hmm. started me on this journey of um yeah trying to understand myself while simultaneously starting to see and understand uh the way that the world works when it comes to cultures of supremacy and cultures of domination. And it was really just this like a complete um, re unearthing of my worldview and reorganization of everything. And Mm -hmm. so I moved to Korea and um, yeah, I was just really alone. It was really by myself. Mm -hmm. And leaving the US and feeling like, you know, I don't feel like I, I've always been made to feel different here, hyper, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, I always have to explain myself, like whatnot. It felt, I'd gone back and done a year of grad school. And so, and I was, um, yeah, it was just really frustrating. It's like you're at a right. university and they want to talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then it's just not part of the actual experience whatsoever. Right, right. Really, and I felt like I was in a pressure cooker. And then coming to Korea, it was just like, ah, oh, all the air is let out. Like the the ability to blend and just exist was something that I'd never experienced before. And so that was really positive, but simultaneously um, I was really alone. And so leaving this, leaving the U S and coming here, but then having to reconcile the fact that like, well, Korea is actually the country that sent me away. Korea yeah. is the country that profited off of selling its children. It's most yeah. vulnerable. Um, and so having to like sit with that too. And yeah, a lot of feelings of not belonging and feeling very alone and just, yeah, very disconnected from, life and very um like a lot of passive suicidal ideation and um just so much pain and I was telling myself at the time like oh you have to feel it to heal it you have to go through it around it and then it wasn't until this year when I was in South Africa and I had done my um 
yoga teacher training. And then I did a 10 day uh, Vipassana silent retreat and I'd done them before. And this was my third one. And it was by far the hardest Mm -hmm. every single day. I was like, I think today's the day I'm going to (laughs) leave. It was just, yeah, really a lot of discomfort. And I realized like, it's, I've been looking for this kind of like silver bullet. Like this is going to fix me, heal me, change me. It's going to be the one thing. And it's like, the pain's going to be there. It's about changing my relationship to the pain, but it's also about holding the pain. And I think I, for a really long time, was in a space of being like really bitter and really angry. And I know, and it comes up sometimes still, and I know I haven't fully processed it because I know I also have a lot of um, like shadow towards anger. So I'm not fully able to like sit with it because I'm like, oh no, I shouldn't feel this way. I don't want to live here forever. Um, But like those feelings will come up. And then what happens is if I don't want to hold it, then I go into blaming and I'm like discharging it. Like it's, you know, this person's fault or this structure's fault or this institution's fault or whatever it may be. And so, you know, during my retreat, it was realizing like when that happens, it's pausing and being like, you know, this happened and part of accepting it, part of, I think it probably falls under surrender too, is being like, I don't have to be okay with the fact that it happened. I have to be able to accept that it did happen. It's in the past. I can't change that it happened. And also recognizing like, it's not a reflection of me. And I struggle with that a lot to really internalize like this person did this or this person said that whatever it may be, this has happened and it doesn't mean anything about me, but the pain is mine. And I have to be able to sit and hold the pain. And yeah, it's really uncomfortable. So my body goes into yeah. hyperarousal. It's like, no, it's much more, it's much better to find yeah. a solution or to fix or to do or whatever. Right, right. Because yeah. I just wanted to also mention and point out how much it is to hold, not just one thing, but you're holding so many things about your identity, where you came from, how you came to where you are. It's so much. And of course, you're going to feel pain. And it's to hold by yourself. I think that's the hardest part. And mm-hmm. during the pandemic, it's probably so isolating. And then also going from this place, this community in South Africa to suddenly coming to Korea, which is, you know, a place where you blend in, but also don't have such a strong connection that you wish you did. And then you also have so many feelings. It's just so much that you've been holding by yourself. I just want to acknowledge that. (laughs) And like, it's not easy to move through it or to even hold it by yourself, even though you mentally know, okay, this is how I can solve it, but to be in it it's hard. And sometimes we can't do it by ourselves, obviously. And also knowing that it's okay to feel those feelings. And also what do I need right now? Knowing that my body is going to learn. My body wants to solve. My body wants to, we want to move through the discomfort. Of course, nobody wants to be in that discomfort, but also, okay, how, what is the sweet balance between letting myself feel it and also taking care of myself. Like, do I need to talk to someone right away? Is there a friend? Is there a therapist I can have on speed dial or something, right? Because whenever we try to hold something, it can, our minds can go into very dark places. <laughs> oh, yes, very easily. And I think too, like my brain will focus on whatever, you know, it's creating its own reality in the sense of like, if it's looking for, neg- if it's in a negative space and it's looking for negativity, then it's that's all that it sees. Um, and yeah, and I, I have incredible friends and they've been so supportive throughout, um, me going through all of this and simultaneously it's like physically, I've been very physically like isolated in my one bedroom apartment here. Um, yeah. And, and it is, it has been a lot. And what you just said, it's like what I've realized and in processing that eventually, like in the near future, I need to leave here mm-hmm. is that when I was in South Africa, I realized like, oh, I can live my life 90% of the time and focus on healing 10% of the time. And here yeah. I feel like I realized recently, like I'm in the like seat of the wound here. Like everything that happens, it feels like everything is a direct line to the trauma of my adoption, of being relinquished, of all of that. And so it's, yeah. it's, it feels like it's 98% of my time and maybe 2% so of the time I can for air. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's leaving and moving and living and not just like, 
Um, I had spoken to someone recently who was like, you know, you can learn to live with your trauma and not in your trauma. Mm. And so, yeah. And like, that sounds very appealing. I feel like I would love to get there. Yeah. 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 I know that you're trying to sort out the next steps. Is there communities here or like expats that are in Korea or like similar people that are, that might understand what you're going through? Do you think that would be helpful? So there is a community of adoptees. Um, I think that with everything was in lockdown until the beginning of this year. So like Korea's really just started to, to open up. Um, and actually just this past week, I started going to a yoga studio, which has been really nice to just have that. It's an English speaking yoga studio um, to just have that space and to, it's really gentle. So just to move my body and to get out of the house and have a, have like a intentional place to go. Um, and that feels like self-care to me. Um, yeah. for sure. And so that's been really nice. And so yeah, I think right now what I'm working through is just like, what do I need to do so I can feel a lot, I can, I can be right with the decision of leaving. And it's hard. And the other day I felt like anger come up again. And I was like, why am I so grumpy? Two days in a row, I was yeah. so grumpy. And I'm like, okay, why am I grumpy? And oftentimes yeah. it's because I'm sad. Like my yeah. sadness will often manifest first as like this like resistance and this like hard kind of barrier it comes out as yeah. like being grumpy or angry. And I realize, like, I'm angry because there's now more grief in mm. processing that I'll leave. You know, it was like all this other grief of like coming back and what I've never had and what I will never have and what I've lost and all these things. And now looking at leaving, it's like, oh, now there's grief about leaving mm. because it's like, I don't, like, I can't stay, but it's not necessarily that I like want to go. I mean, there's a right. point that I go. Right. Yeah. It's almost like, a lot of conflicting feelings here as well it's you want to belong here but it's also you mentioned it's being at the core of the wound mm. so I guess if we take emotions are very important but right now you think about it what would happen if you stay for another five years and what would happen if you leave how do those feelings feel in your body mm. So I had a conversation with a friend's healer recently. And one of the things she said, she was like, you can stay, nothing's gonna happen. And I was like, oh, like nothing's gonna happen for better or for worse, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can stay and I can just kind of like be here and float in this like bit of a liminal space, um, which feels, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It feels comfortable because it's familiar. It's not mm -hmm. like comfortable because, oh, this feels like nice. It's like, oh, it's comfortable because it's familiar. Um, and then in thinking about leaving, it's interesting. <laughs> I actually had another session with one of the yoga teachers um, that led the training I did was doing a, a training with Gabor Mate. Is that how you mm -hmm. say his yeah. last name? Yeah, and so it's a lot of like somatic, um, somatic therapy. And so I had done a practical with her and staying lives in the left side of my body and going lives in the right side of my body. And the left side of my body is like where I feel this constant strain in my chest area. It's like a, it's like a physical pain. And I know it's somatic. Like I know if I went to the doctor, they're not going to be like, you are having a heart attack. Like I know it's yeah. somatic but it feels like a yearning. It feel, It's a space of not enough. It's the space of deprivation. It's the space of fear and insecurity. Um, and so staying lives in that kind of left side of my body. And as much as it's uncomfortable, it's also very familiar. Mm -hmm. And then on the right side of my body um, is, it feels very like sterile. It feels like being naked in like the middle of a room. <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. just, it's very, um, scary and new. And I don't know, maybe it feels like possibility, even though I feel like possibility has like a more positive connotation <laughs> than what I feel in my body when I think of that. But yeah, leaving is like, it's taking a leap. It's, it's leaving this, what's become familiar. And I do think that I am a little bit attached to like, um, 
over intellectualizing like you know squeezing the puppy like I need to understand this like yeah. really like trying like uh, being attached to that trauma and leaving and living and taking risks and everything else lives in this like right side of my body um and it feels scary it mm -hmm. feels scary in a way yeah it feels scary and it feels like I don't know I've been thinking lately too about what Brene Brown says about courage, which is like, it's not yeah. the absence of fear. It's that you have fear and you do it anyways. Yeah. 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 And what so it would feel like an opportunity for that. Okay. I, there's a side you're leaning on <laughs> I, <laughs> and I know you're battling through a lot of things. What would feel safer for your body right now? Oh, wow. Hmm. Oh, that's so interesting because my mind is like, we must move into the right side of my body. But my body is like, it feels like held by the mm -hmm. left side of like the pain and everything else. It feels like, I don't know. It feels like it's been laying there for a long time. So there's like a little bed that's been made that's shaped to the, shaped to the shape of my body. That's very comfortable there. And it's not that, you know, it's like, I'm just coasting by, like I'm frustrated often. And I feel this disconnect from life because I'm not, I'm not working right now. And, um, and I think there's some, some stuff there where it's like, I could stand to change my relationship to the idea of work and what that needs to be. And, you know, how that filters into like an idea of success and all of these other things that have been um that I've been indoctrinated into but I also think that um I want to live a life of service in some way and I think that that's important to being kind of in the flow of life and being in alignment and I just don't know what that like entry what that portal yeah, is yeah yeah um, I mean there's definitely a lot of mental energy going trying to like rationalize things it's very human and also you have the 61 24 this mm -hmm. energy means that your crown your head and your mind is always defined and the head is where you have the questions for life the why how the what's the doubts, that's where all the questions are. And then you also have the mind who's trying to rationalize it, who's trying to make sense of it. So this energy is going to be there. But then in human design, your authority is emotional. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so with an emotional authority, you're here to ride your emotional waves. You're not here to make any decisions when your wave is on a high or on a low. You're going to feel the extremes. This is what is guiding you, your emotions. There is not good or bad. Like you said, it's learning to hold it, holding the full spectrum of emotions and knowing what you need to hold it. Like I mentioned, you don't need to hold it by yourself. Certain Sometimes when we're going through an emotional process, it could be helpful to just not even think about the emotion. It could just be helpful to move our bodies, for instance. You know, Sometimes mm -hmm. so much about solving the problem or figuring it out is not addressing it. <laughs> I'm not saying to deny it, but like the more that we try to like spearhead at the issue, or whatever it's making us uncomfortable at times, it's too much for our body to mm. try to deal with that because it's holding the discomfort and it's trying to solve it. It doesn't have space for clarity. And part of your emotional wave is kind of waiting for when you're in the middle where you're not feeling a high, life is great, or feeling the lows, like life sucks because you're always going to be fluctuating in between those. It's almost like, I feel a little bit neutral right now. I feel like, okay, I've got it insights from the high and insights from the low. And then you kind of know where to go next when you're in the middle or know what to do right now for yourself. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, I, whenever I'm feeling a strong emotion, which is often, I'm always like, I live here now. Like this is, I'm going to feel this way forever. Yeah. And I always, I have trouble just like zooming out and remembering it's a wave, this too shall pass. It's a wave. It's a wave. Yeah. And having that center defined, that means your wave is going to be constant and it's an individual. So you're 39, 55, that 
that channel, it's an individual where your mood kind of like you're feeling great and then it might just spike or drop and you feel not great. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah. It's, it's kind of how it operates. There's nothing wrong with you because I think society has conditioned us to be like, oh, learn to sit with your emotions and all that. No, you're allowed to feel, you know, the sudden drop. Okay, mm -hmm. how can you hold space without judging? And that comes with practice. It's here to bring insight. And another sort of interesting thing that could maybe help or validate the way that you feel is that you also have the gate of crisis. That is gate 36. I mean, like it's yes. So, <laughs> and it's also in your Mars energy, which is like a very immature energy here to fight. You're here to kind of really hone this energy. Whatever you feel, sometimes you might, it might also lead you to feeling a crisis. And the crisis doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. The feeling the crisis gives you insight. If you're not judging it, if you're able to take a step back from it, you're like, why is this crisis? You're like, okay, I'm feeling, for instance, somebody used an example of like their daughter, they have this crisis energy. They would like put on some clothes to go to school. They're like, my socks don't match. What the hell? Like everything's going to be, uh, and then her mom is like, oh, okay. It's okay. Just change socks. Yeah, but I'm going to waste two minutes out of it. They're like, okay. So it feels like a lot right now. How can you allow it to happen? And then you might notice that the crisis is suddenly gone afterwards. So this knowing... is why I love human design. Cause I'm like, yes, like it feels so <laughs> validating to be like, you're okay. It's your crisis line. <laughs> yes, it is your crisis gate. And it just, you're going to feel it. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. I think it's when we start to judge and think like, why do I not feel like other people? Why do I go through the ups and downs? Is that sometimes we feel like oh, something's wrong with us, but it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I meant to go through that. How can I hold this safely? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes people need some therapy or like pills just to help at the beginning until they're aware of this energy so they can hold it instead of thinking something's wrong with me or I'm doing something wrong. What is the gift in that though? <laughs> Such the, high, intense, low, intense emotions like that. The gift is that you get to experience the full spectrum of emotions. And there's a lot of beauty and creativity that even comes in like the melancholy, because mm -hmm. you're going to go through waves of melancholy in the low. You know, the beauty and the pain of human experience is that we get to experience and be aware of those things, even though we might not be able to move out of it. If you think about songs or poems, or, you know, Shakespeare, so much of that creativity came out of that pain of sitting with it. Mm. There is, is this the, I'm trying to think of when I, um, hold on, let me see. Is this the um, incarnation cross? Uh, you're, so okay. you're 55, it's part of your incarnation cross, which is the gate of spirit. I think that's what it's called. And that means you're always here to be aware of like, oh, what should I feel? What, what should I get into? Like, so you also have the 39, which provokes people into getting to the right mood, into the right spirit. It's kind of this energy of like, do you want to try to sell to feel it? Because when we feel things, we get insight. It's just <laughs> when we're trying to also think about the insight we're getting, when we're trying to rationalize it, that's when we sometimes block whatever we're feeling. Mm, okay well because I just remember reading somewhere that one of the um pieces of my chart was supposed to be like this is your purpose or this is like what you're supposed to do in life right right so a part of that energy that you feel is that you're naturally gonna provoke people bring people into the right spirit for them and your incarnation cross is something that just happens when you're embodying who you are. It's not something that you try, mm -hmm. which is sometimes in a reading, it's one of the last things I get into because we worried about our purpose and our dharma. And so much of that happens when we are simply aligned with ourselves, doing the things we want to do. And it's just like a side effect. <laughs> it's like of how that gets fulfilled. It's, it's, I think it might come with like, because of all the healing I've done, it happens when we're living life, not when we're trying to live life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like that makes sense.
<laughs> and then I want to ask you, so you said that my crown and that up here, that it's defined. So what is that, that the energy? Defined, that means you always have like a consistent energy of like, what are the questions that I'm answering? What are the mysteries in life? Because the channel, your 6124, it's about trying to figure out life's mysteries. Like why, why do things happen? Why, why, why? And that's something that you might feel the consistent pressure of asking yourself all the time, which can take away from your emotional authority, especially when you're feeling you're riding an emotional wave your mind and your um, your crown might try to rationalize it. When, how can you learn for, you know, when there is time for questions, allow it to happen, but also allow your emotions to flow before we start editing them. That's something that took me a while to learn. If I was feeling an emotional low or anything, I was trying to rationalize it. Like, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? Maybe there's a lesson here. And it's almost like the feeling was like, uh, I just need to like, let me expand a little bit. But I, was, I wasn't letting myself do that. Okay, how do you do that now? I go for walks, I dance. So there's it's a like regulating, saying, regulation. It's regulating, yes. There's also in Strala Yoga, something that like Mike uses, one of the founders, it's like surround a dragon instead of fighting the dragon head on head. I think it comes from a Chinese saying, <laughs> and I'm probably butchering it if somebody knows the actual saying, where, you know, when you try to fight a dragon, you're not fighting right in front of it because there's no way you're going to lose. But how can you surround a dragon, go around it? You're still dealing with it, but you're being very careful. So kind yeah. of like with our emotions and moods, it's like, <gasps> I used to like spearhead, like, let's fix this. I'm a fixer. I can do it. And then I would get yeah. sick and burn out. And then I realized, oh my gosh, so much of healing isn't 90% healing. It's not 100% of your life. Because then I felt like every decision I had to make had to go towards healing. Otherwise, oh, if I eat some junk food, it's going to throw me out of balance. And it was this constant fear of doing the wrong thing. Yeah, I get that. 100%. I think whenever we're, we start healing, we realize, we realize all the things that we've been doing wrong. So we yeah. start to break our lives like, oh, this is what I need to wake up earlier. I need to meditate. And then life becomes not living, but instead like trying to live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it can be a lot. It can be very heavy. And then that sets us on a state of <laughs> alert and stressed instead of being able to just honor whatever it's feeling. And it's always, it sounds so simple, but it's easier said than done when we are, you know, caught up in all the things that we should do or could do. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, your chart really, when you talk about your experience, it, it shows kind of the tension that you feel, which is, you know, having the definition of the emotional center, which is meant to feel all the emotions, go through the crisis, you know, get into the spirit. It's also a very moody channel, like the 3955, I think is a channel of emoting. And it's also like, you do things when you feel like you're in the mood of it. If you force yourself, you might be moody, you might be cranky. And then you also feel crisis. There's this energy that you're working with, like, oh, why am I feeling the crisis? It's also like, oh. but crisis also means that whatever happens in the future, you're able to manage it because you felt it all. Okay. You know, people <laughs> might even go to you because they're like, hey, I, they might come to you for advice because it feels like you are able to hold this spectrum that not everybody has this constant energy to deal with. Yeah, I feel like so much of my energy is spent planning out like my the infinite decision matrix and like living in each possibility and yeah feeling crisis about things that haven't even happened just the possibility of them and I think what you said about um fear of doing the wrong thing a million percent like I I I don't yeah a million percent that's something that weighs on me and I think I don't know I think it it comes back in some cases too to just like how do I trust my like that root chakra chakra of like can I trust? Like, can I trust myself? And I've been yeah. feeling that a lot this week too, where like, I'll feel really positive things. And then I'll like go into like catastrophizing, like, no, like, you know, and then, and really not being able to just ground out in like, what is it that I actually want? And can I do it like, and take a risk? Like I'm, I'm yeah. pretty risk averse. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I, which I can also speak to in your chart. So there's so many things that I'm like, can I go to human design? Can I like dive deeper into like all that thing about trust? So I think sometimes defining trust or just looking at trusting in ourselves doesn't mean we don't feel fear. Doesn't mean we don't feel the chaos or crisis. I think sometimes when we make decisions and we feel a crisis or the chaos, we feel like we're doing the wrong thing. Mm. But there, what if there isn't? What if life is really 
what you make of it. There's no wrong route, like stay in Korea or not stay. There's no right or wrong answer there. It's not black and white like that because no matter what reality we choose, we always adapt to it. What if we can take the pressure of thinking that we're doing the wrong thing? And what if we can just connect to our body mm-hmm. and be sit with whatever, learning to hold, expand the capacity to feel all the things and knowing that you don't need to solve it unless, you know, I need to go to emergency right now because I am like, you know, I cut my finger. I can't just feel it right now. You know, I'm just like going to an extreme, like, you know, what if I can hold those uncomfortable emotions? What if I, what, do, what can I hold right now? It's not about holding it all because I think sometimes we've tried to hold it all, all the things that we've uncovered that is not working and it's not, you know, we wouldn't be living if we we're spending it on survival hundred percent on the time. It's very exhausting, yeah. but I wanted to speak to your open center. So you're also, triple split so you're you have three centers of energies that are connected to like two centers that are connected to themselves but it's not your definition (laughs) I'm like I'm not saying this properly so you have three centers that are defined but they're not connected to each other oh okay so definition it's not good or bad (laughs) there's no good or bad here (laughs) so definition in human design is how your energies talk to each other And being a triple split, you have your crown and your mind defined. That's one center. It's not connected to your throat yet, but you have a throat and your identity G center defined. And that center is also like, oh, what direction? What can I talk to? Like what I feel gravitated to. And then you also have the root and your emotional center defined. So those three centers, it's almost like you have three different voices inside of you. And what helps you access them is moving through different auras, having different group of friends, having different group of environments to go to. Like you really need that to be able to access and help kind of connect. You're designed to be outside, to connect with people, to also, you know, because that helps you connect to yourself. What do you mean by being outside, to be designed to be outside? Designed to be engaging with the world in a way, in different groups. Oh, yeah. You might have different groups of friends, different groups for different purposes of things that's so interesting because so when I was in South Africa and I was like I was moving between a lot of spaces and I felt so um there's a lot of privilege in being able to do that and I felt really I don't know like it did something for me and I think because I don't feel at home in any one specific place you know that it feels yeah like having multiple spaces to move between feels um I don't know what the right word is yeah but it it feels (laughs) it feels natural yeah yeah Yeah. your energies want to move around your energies want to engage with people and also you have um left angle cross which is you're here for the other you're here for yourself but through the other you connect to yourself as opposed to a right angle who's really here for their own process. Even when they engage, you're here to like, okay, it's a very self-absorbed process. The energy is slightly different. Yours is like, you're here to move through different people. You're here to, sometimes maybe somebody at a coffee shop just have like a two minute conversation and you might've stirred something in them without knowing. You know, that's how your energy- I'm here for the other. Cause to me, what that brings up is like, like, yeah tell me more <laughs> yeah I know what you mean I know what you mean the the language sometimes like it's so hard to like contain the human experience in language you're simply here to like through the other you connect to yourself it doesn't mean you're here for them so maybe I phrase it for them. like through outside experiences through engaging with people you gain access you gain more insights into yourself you gain yeah yeah like it kind of hits the parts of you that resonates with it it doesn't mean that you're lacking in any way It just means like it hits part of you that is like the frequencies you're like, yes, that's my thing. Or like, that's not my thing. That's so interesting because I went through a period. I can, I can feel it in my body. I don't remember exactly what it was, when it was, but it was this feeling of like this fear of like, oh, I'm like overly codependent because like, I feel that when I interact with people, I'm like, oh, I feel more regulated. I feel more fulfilled. I feel more whatever it may be. And it was this, what, yeah. And I I had interpreted it at the time of like, oh, maybe I just have this like, which I do have codependence, like codependency <laughs> that I need to work on among other things. But like, but yeah, that's really affirming to hear that like, that's just a way that, is it, so 
here for the other as in like it makes me feel more fulfilled to I wouldn't use fulfill okay so maybe take out the word here for the other you're here (laughs) through the other you access yourself maybe that is less (laughs) because then sometimes here for the other just sounds like oh my gosh I'm what about my what I want what I desire that doesn't mean that's not important but moving through different energies and being around different group of people just it gives you the variety that you crave let's say you crave variety you need that you your energies move the best like that especially as a triple split um no one person is going to be everything for you no one place is going to be everything for you interesting you're here so to how explore does how does that translate yeah to like building yourself. a life and relationships <laughs> and everything else I mean it's something that only you know as long as you're honoring like through so every group that you go to what parts of you does it bring out how does it make you feel and also know that those feelings might be temporary because you also ha- as a triple split <laughs> you also have a few open centers which is a completely open spleen and the completely open spleen, is, it's a center for intuition of fears. And a center when it's open or undefined means that you're taking it on from others. So does that mean I have no fear of my own, that all fears that I feel are other people's fears? It's a mix. So you might be taking on a fear that is not yours, but you also have your own fears that might be emphasized or enhanced by someone else's fear. Mm. Again, nothing is black and white. And I think sometimes when I started learning about humans, I'm like, but okay, is that the reason for this? It's like, oh, yeah. this and many other things. So like the spleen is the center of intuition. It also means you're highly intuitive because you can take on the intuition. You can kind of like board that energy and access part of yourself and you explore all the gates because it's completely open. You don't know when, <laughs> what energy you have once in a while sometimes. So let's say your undefined heart, it has a 51 gate that is hanging there. So when somebody with a defined heart center, when it activates you, it goes through the 51 gate as an example. But with a spleen completely open eight gates, it goes through everywhere, eight or seven, seven gates. <laughs> it just means that you feel the full spectrum of all the fears of all the intuition that is coming from that center that survival center but it's not consistent because it's not an energy that you have all the time so sometimes you might feel safe around people and one of the the not self of the undefined or the shadow expressions of the open spleen is like holding on to things for longer than it should because I feel safe with that person even though like you know this should have ended or this situation this place whatever it is I just want to hold on because there's comfort there, but doesn't mean it's for you right now. And is that comfort because I picked it up from somebody else? It's mm, the comfort could be how it just feels nice and safe to be in a defined spleen. So undefined open spleens, uh-huh. sometimes they like to hold on to someone with a healthy speed, healthy spleen. Because think about it, when you're amplifying all those fears and emotions from people, not all of them might be in a healthy expression. So when you find one that might be healthy or it makes you feel good, you want to hold on to it. Okay. And the lesson is really learning that, okay, you know, I, I can feel healthy on my own. I don't need to hold on to anything. Mm. And as a triple split, your undefined centers sometimes could be louder than your defined centers because your defined centers are not connected unless you're like doing the things moving around. And, you know, the undefined heart is also about worthiness. It's about um, the material world. It's about will and power. It's like, do I have the willpower to do this? And when you mention like, what is my desire? What do I want? Having an undefined heart, you might not always have access to your desires at all times, which is why it's not guiding you. Someone that has a def- defined heart, it's always encouraged, like follow your desires, follow that because you have the willpower to always sustain you. Your guidance you know, your authority is your emotions, which is like, you were like, this is so unpredictable, but yeah. Uh, That's so interesting because I've been, I've been grappling with this inside of like romantic relationships, this feeling of like, I get very easily like swept up when there's like an other and then having trouble just kind of like grounding out and figuring out like, what are my desires? Like, how do I feel? Like, what is it that I want? Like, what is, yeah. And so do you feel like that's related to that? Yeah. Cause you can definitely amplify someone who has their desire, their um, heart will center to find, you can amplify that and you can also take on their desire almost as your own. Cause you feel it. So any undefined open center, we take it on, it activates something in us. It connects to what we already had, 
or sometimes it's not even ours to begin with. Mm. So like, it's always so layered. It's, it's never like just black and white because you know, our, the human experience. <laughs> uh, binary like that. Yeah. So yeah. what, so then how do, for the centers that are open for my, so it's my spleen and my heart that are open. And also your sacral, your sacral is kind of this, um, it's the life force energy. It's the, the energy to do, to be like producing, to making things, having it undefined means that you experience, you might have an inconsistent energy spike, like ebbs and flow. When I learned I was a, I was a projector and I was living and trying to operate as a generator, I was like, no wonder my body couldn't keep up because I would be mm -hmm. amplifying people's like, you know, I also have an undefined root center, which is like the pressure to do, like it literally puts the energy to do, to get into action, adrenaline, and then the sacral center, which is a, it's also the, the center for like pleasure, reprodu reproduction. Mm -hmm. And it's also about like doing things like, what do I have my life force energy? And I don't have a consistent life force. We don't have that. We amplify once in a while. And sometimes we can get addictive, especially like when we're doing something that feels good and we get into a momentum. And then I don't know if you notice it, I lose the momentum. And then I feel like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Yes. Am, I doing, am I not eating enough? And I like eating too much junk food? Am I not sleeping enough? Do I need actually no I am designed to just amplify once in a while I don't need to hold on but we're so conditioned in this society to figure things out to be doing all the time to be operating oh I struggle with that it's even you say it and I'm like hmm because I do I'll have like a creative whim of inspiration I'm like oh like blah 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 and like make a plan and then the next day it's like who wrote that like who's who's <laughs> writing that like what's happening then? like you know like if right. you're feeling, feeling completely disconnected and unmotivated from it and then really struggling with that yeah because, so yeah. that's both your like the heart center energy maybe it's stopping the fine that that's what it means that you don't have consistent willpower you don't have a consistent access to mm -hmm. your desires they might be a bit more muddier because it's not a consistent energy you have but the mm -hmm. plus side you know the beauty the gifts of those open and defined centers that you get to experience them from others you get to amplify it you get to learn from them but also learning to release that's the biggest thing releasing those energies, the sacral, the spleen, the fears, or the intuitions that you get, like you're very connected to yourself, you have the awareness, but you might be amplifying, you know, sometimes the fear of other people, whenever you get into contact with them, even without knowing, and it might tap into a fear that you already had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like, see, this is why I shouldn't have done this. And then later on, you might feel like, oh, it was okay, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So with, with, the centers that are open, like specifically around fear and intuition, and then also around um, holding on to things and feeling safe and having an undefined heart, like, and desire. Yeah. How do I kind of know where my, like, do I have my, how do I know what's mine and know what's not mine and like know what to, is that where I go back to the authority of my emotional authority? Your emotional authority, but also like sometimes writing it out feels good but sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a matter of practice of sensitizing just like you know emotions you do have a defined emotion but it doesn't mean that you're not sensitive to other people's emotions mm -hmm. right so like the more that we practice it's easier to recognize that and I know that that's not like the ultimate answer but so much of this awareness starts with being aware and then practice and there's no right or wrong I think even if a desire wasn't yours it probably taught you something by following it or by oh yeah this is not aligned to me you know those little tidbits of information and data that we get so it's not trying necessarily to not amplify it or to it's allowing just the experience and just to be aware of like what to be aware of it and then afterwards when you out of that aura or that space you can always sit and ground in your body I guess mm -hmm. grounding in your body is what helps the most because your body it cannot there's no like mental energy in it sometimes we're like oh why are we feeling but if we're able to just like sit with and notice what we're holding it's like maybe a little bit of tension here and all that and just see and just see what happens like does it stay here for a while or like yeah maybe i i am a little stressed how can i release it maybe some deep breathing because when we're sensitizing to how our body feels we're able to kind of like know a little bit better what's ours or what did we pick up on the way maybe I picked up something on the grocery store especially I mean during the pandemic there was so much fear that you were taking in and it's not really about not amplifying or being away from people because you don't want to amplify that 
that center is just knowing, okay, how can I hold all those things and release it when it's time to release it? Think of yourself as like a sieve. Is that the word sieve or, you know, filter yeah. through, let it filter through, yeah. air purifier. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I had read somewhere or had heard somewhere like projectors should sleep alone because you're oh, in other people's you're, energy. Yeah. <laughs> I've read things like that too. And at the end of the day, it's like try it out and see if it does help you or not. Like my husband's a generator. Like we sleep in the same room. Sometimes okay. I'm always like, would I sleep better without it? But I'm like, you know what? So far I'm okay. I've learned to find something that works. But when I first mm -hmm. learned about it, I would be kind of like a little bit bitter. I'm like, you should have been working out because you haven't used all your sacral energy. And now it's like going to me when you're asleep snoring, but I'm not. But then I realized, <laughs> okay, you know, information is information. There's no good or bad. Like, am I suffering? Not really. I just found a way to like do my routine that helps me unwind. So there are suggestions out there, but it's also at the end of the day, you get to choose it. You get to see like what feels experimented with my body. Yeah, I love that. And I think grounding and I think because even I think the sleep thing is about also just like having that space to ground. And um, I'm taking this course right now. And this week we we went through like a visualization of like clearing your energies and like rooting down into the earth and like um, energy from above and energy from below and and running energy through our bodies. And it was, I did it the other night and I was feeling so tense and all these feelings ahead of time. And then after I was like, wow, I just felt, I felt tired and it was good because I was in that hyper aroused, like go, go, go mode. And after yeah. I did it, I was like, oh, I feel tired. Cause I feel like I could actually sleep. Cause I feel like yeah. I was able to kind of like clear some of that yes. anxious hyper aroused energy out, which was really Yeah, nice. yeah. Like yeah. if you think about it, energy, wants to be moved energy is here to be moved mm. sometimes we can move it with somebody else you know through conversation or you know other times when we're by ourselves and you're feeling hyper aroused it's about grounding how can you ground and connect to your body so you can at least you know help move it in some way doesn't mean you're fixing the discomfort or you need to address it there is a safe time and place for it and it might not be all the time sometimes not dealing with whatever the root of this is right now at the moment can help because we I feel like the most the lessons that we learn are usually when we're not looking for the lessons it's when we're living life and something clicks it's when we're not trying as hard mm. yeah I mean I definitely go into over intellect an over intellectualization as like a coping mechanism and as a another form of like being in that dysregulated state um yeah. and like trying to self-protect and that's when I think it was it was uh beginning of last year of 2021 when I just really got into poetry because I was mm -hmm. like oh it like it bridges this gap between like oh I'm reading and I'm using my brain and this and that but like I'm feeling in my body yes which is really powerful yeah. yeah and it could also support your mood so like the channel your your emotion authority it's also getting into the mood for things maybe some music is a very acoustic channel certain tunes or poetry or like creativity stories like it it likes to move in that way if you think about so moving energy that's so interesting because sound is so powerful for me so so powerful yeah yeah, yeah. like people's voices are, are like real like yeah, it sound is very, um, like I'm very attracted to sound. Like sound it holds a lot of um, yeah. weight. Yeah, wait, so if you're going through something, if you notice that you're, oh, I'm riding high or low, maybe you can test around and experiment around like playlists or what sounds help me maybe tune into my body and also at the same time, like help me hold it maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even for me, like sighing or humming or sometimes when I want, there's a mountain behind my house that I'll take my dog for a walk on. And if like no one's around and just like singing, like it helped that, that vibration in the, yes. in the body helps. Yeah. It just helps period. Like I just, feel yeah, much it's a, it's a also known as an acoustic channel. Like it does, like, like you said, it, it wants to move through music. It helps it a lot. So if you're able to also make space for that, not to solve it or to change because you can never change whatever emotion you are, but just hold it. What helps you hold it? What helps you move that energy? And then later on, the insights will come or the clarity will come. Your wave will, it's not always going to be on a high and it's never going to be on a low. The surround the dragon is just really, yeah. Like it's just really, it's so powerful. Because when you're just saying like, it's not to solve or change it. Like you're not trying to like spar with the dragon. It's what helps you hold it. Like you're just trying to surround 
surround the dragon. And I love yeah. that because my instinct is always like, oh gosh, this thing is here. What can I do about it? Like, how do I understand it? And it's just like squeezing the puppy. Like, how can I? Yeah, it, and, and at the root of it, right, is still that discomfort and that um, resistance towards just feeling whatever it is that I'm feeling. Yeah, and like really not yeah. wanting, wishing it away or wishing it different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you, we wanna protect ourselves. And also I feel like uh, our generation, we're more aware of emotions and the importance of holding it and we cannot like push it down. But I feel like a lot of other generations before us didn't have those tools. So what mm -hmm. they did was repressing it. It was like, yeah. do not feel it, you know, look at anti-feminism <laughs> out there. It's like, don't feel your feelings for like men and all that. And, but also for women, it was like, be a doer. Like distract yourself from feeling those emotions and now we're suddenly learning how to hold it it's not easy it's really about yeah. it takes time to build your capacity to hold more mm -hmm. and especially if you we spent our entire lives not being able to hold it I used to bottle up my emotions for the longest time and I remember just feeling so completely numb because I was so used to not feeling them that I my brain was like you're feeling touch but I couldn't access those emotions because I had numbed them so much and then building my capacity to hold like therapy help, doing yoga, being around friends. Slowly, I realized I was able to hold more without, you know, spiraling. But even if I spiral, you know, you have the crisis gate. You might spiral. How can you do it safely? How can you let yourself root? But also, okay, root myself. You know, mm -hmm. let yourself feel it and also root. Doesn't mean anything is wrong. I think if anything could be the most validating and supportive of you right now, it's like all the, you know, the crisis that you feel, you know, all that uncertainty doesn't mean you're not, you're doing anything wrong right now. That is very affirming. Yeah. That is so, that's so reassuring. Cause I think it is like, um, yeah, especially looking at getting caught up in like, what do I do? And what is my this? And what is the future? And where will I be in this and that? It is a bit of like, yeah, I think, I think often when I feel bad, my brain interprets it as like, you are bad. And oh, so it's yeah. like, what have, like, why am I, I thought I've been doing better. I thought I, this, I've been doing this, yeah. I've been doing this, that, like, why am I feeling this? And then just to know, like, you know, I'm just going to feel it and just to allow myself to feel it and to not feel that sense of, I always feel the sense of urgency inside of it of like, I need to figure it out right now. I need to solve it. Like I need to come to a decision and to really just like allow it. But I guess my question then is like, but when do I make decisions then? <laughs> how do I make decisions then? Like when, yeah, like how do I, yeah. If I'm always kind of in this like up and down in this flux and, you know, yeah. having these three different centers and also taking on other energy and like, like how do you know when? When do I get time off yeah. from what? Yeah. <laughs> I think again with practice, but it would, I think the more you practice, you'll notice when you're in a high and you notice when you're in a low. And then there's a middle where the waters are a little bit still. They're not rocking. You're just kind of like, okay, I'm good. That's when you, whatever decision you're trying to make, it feels like, okay, I can, I can take this next step. It's when you have a little bit of clarity. You will never be a hundred percent clear. Like this is the thing. You will never. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful. I that, and I love that. Yeah, because it's like you're a hundred percent. It's gonna feel like eighty percent, and that yes. feels so resonant for me. Because it's like I'm. It was like you know you're gonna read all of the things, like all the negatives, all the positives. You'll net out somewhere, but you're still gonna have in the back of your head like this could go wrong. And yes. it felt really, really. Um, yeah, I keep using the word affirming. I don't know if that's the right word, but it felt yeah. just like really powerful to be like, oh, like, you know, it's never going to be an overwhelming, just like throw caution to the wind. Like, yes, let's do it. Yes. Like everything's great. There's always going to be like some trepidation, but that 80% along with the trepidation is 100% for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then with the completely open spleen, the fear is going to be there. And you mm -hmm. might talk to someone and you're like, oh, and then realize like, okay, did I feel this at the beginning or not? It's like, okay, it's fine. Like understanding your fears. I think that's also important when they're present, not as something bad, but also how can you build a relationship with them? How can you get into, you know, a place and say like, okay, fear, thank you for showing up. What are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to protect me from? You know, because you do have this mental energy, you're probably going to go there, even though if you practice, because it's not about shutting off your mind, especially in meditation, it might not work for you to go completely silent, or like quiet the mind. 
it's not your mind wants to focus on something so give it something to focus that is not about solving that is not geared towards like fixing mm -hmm. give it something to focus maybe scanning the body maybe noticing things around you but don't try to empty your mind because this mental energy is going to be there, but it's about not turning the attention into fixing, into healing, into like something's wrong with me. Mm, you have wow. that energy. How can you use it in a way that supports wow. you? Yeah. <laughs> you saying like, wow, wow. I had not made the, it makes so much sense, but I had not made the connection of like every time that I go into that fixing mode, it's coming from this core idea of like something's wrong with me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it could be the undefined heart. It's feeling, you know, worthiness or lack of worthiness because like, why am I not able to cope compared to others? And the beauty of the center is like, it has so much wisdom about like, you know, what is it for me? What are my desires? What are people's willpowers? Like you're able to observe, but you're not here to be competitive. You're not here to like prove in any way. And it sounds so weird, especially in the, society where we are conditioned to you know do this career step on those milestones but you're not here to prove you're here to witness all of the proving that's happening around you witness what our people are doing and you don't need to be part of the game interesting <laughs> well because i think you know what you had said something earlier about kind of being on the outside and like how, like moving between spaces and I, I feel that and I think I've tried so so long to figure out like you know where is that like sense of belonging where is that sense of home and like yeah hearing like it's not one place that it's you know kind of in that third space of like between places and whatever it may be um yeah I have to sit with that but I also think I don't know I think it brings up a lot of questions for me <laughs> You know, like I'm not here to be competitive or to prove. And I've lived my whole life that way, trying to like prove myself or trying to fit in or trying to, um, I'm like, if I can just get it right, then I can, you know, receive love, like whatever it may yeah. be. So it's like in shifting that and to just witnessing, um, oh, I feel like the a release of pressure in my chest when I said yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but then my brain's going and it's like, okay, <laughs> but then like you're unsafe if you're not doing and you're unsafe if you're not proving and you're unsafe if you're not yeah. doing, doing, going, going, going. Yeah. And yeah, I guess it still brings up for me the question of like, well, I don't know, I guess I'll ask like for projectors it's a thing of like, you have to wait for the ask. Like what is that? Wait for the invitation. Yeah. That was yeah, one of the first thing I wanted to talk, but we went through so many. I'm like, we can come back to that. But I also wanted to bring back, oh, there was something on the tip of my tongue that it's leaving now. How, you know, how right now you notice the stories that were attached, you know, that's the conditioning that's, you know, mm -hmm. they, in human design, they talk about how do you decondition to your essence of those undefined open centers how do you come back to who you are like you're not here to prove and maybe that's something you always knew at your core but because we're so heavily conditioned to say this is right this is wrong that you know how can you rewire that to say actually that doesn't feel true for me what is the truth right now that could be like a grounding question what is the truth for me instead of thinking about your desires what is the truth that i want to live back because again your mind wants to munch on things your mind you know immediately you're like those are my like the, the the beliefs that I have that are coming out okay you can write them down maybe you can hold them when you have space or you feel like you have the capacity to and also like what is the truth right now do I need to figure my entire rest of my life right now today maybe not <laughs> um wow yeah wow wow <laughs> Well, because in my head, I'm like, the, the truth is like to just live, like you're saying, and to be in the flow of life. And like, it doesn't, and just this, I, the idea that I have, like, I need to figure out what my dharma is and my calling, and I need to have this like career and it needs to be this, you know, like hierarchical, vertical, like linear projection, like what, you know, like that's all conditioned. And 
Yeah, just like, I, I think when you, there's whatever you just said, when it clicked, it was this like, oh, like I can just like invite more ease. Like I can live in ease. Like there can be more ease. Like it doesn't need to be this constant wrangling and this like need to like strive and, and do, do, do. But I guess within that, how do I figure out like you can't survive as a human, just like witnessing, you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Because you still need to work, right? You still need right. to make money and all that, but it's also like, am I doing it in a way that is aligned to me? Is it, is it true flow to me? Mm. It, it might be harder because it's not like, Oh, get a nine to five and I have a salary and it all makes sense. It might be like, how do I figure it out? what works for me. And I think for a lot of people, even those that were in careers and they quit it, they had to kind of come with a reckoning of like, I've been living a life that was not mine. Mm -hmm. I've been holding on to stories and beliefs that were very painful, but it's time to let go. I'm at a different phase now, but I'm still holding on to that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things with this, I know I worked a nine to five and it was terrible. Like I found the the toxicity of like corporate office culture to be so drained like I just couldn't handle it like I just yeah. could not handle it and then I also found the concept of like FaceTime at a desk to be so silly it's like I finished my work it's two o'clock <laughs> I want to like be able to live my life but I have to sit here to make everyone else around me feel more comfortable because that's yeah. what we do like that just to me is yeah the co whole concept just like I, I, I do feel like I, I need to do something where I feel like I'm primarily living and doing something that I'm really passionate about, but that like, I'm not beholden to a desk, yeah. my, what feels like my entire life. And then I get like 10 days off to live my life. Yeah, like that, yeah. that's very <laughs> not. And then like, when your vacation is off, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go back. And then the rest is like panic living in that, you know, some people like it because they loved our job. Some people are designed for it if you know that you're not then okay time to carve out our little way doesn't mean we need to know 10 steps ahead what about what is the next step right now I don't need to know where the step is going but what is the next step that is aligned that is true for me because we never know the rest of our steps as much as my head tried to plan it I'm like things never go according to plan and I overwhelm around it but what if I can just take the next step where I'm honoring myself where you know maybe I want to do 10,000 things that would be so great for me but right now I just want to Netflix this is what my body wants and I feel happy about it okay if I feel guilt how can I work with that guilt you know is it conditioned with me that's why I'm feeling guilty you know, because we have these like inner guidance that we keep editing and overriding with the conditioning and the shits from other people, which is why it makes us second guess ourselves and not trust ourselves as well. But the more we practice and we sensitize to like, ah, oh, what is that guidance telling us? Oh, it tells me I want to go to a coffee shop right now, even though I should be writing out my life plan. I'm going to go to a coffee shop and maybe you'll meet someone there and get into a conversation, bump into a friend, you know, those things that we never plan for that are so nourishing to us. What are we doing in our days that are nourishing to us? Mm. Yeah. You saying like carve out a little way and not needing to know every 10 steps ahead. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds so freeing. And I know that it's like a trauma response to try and like understand every, like the decision matrix of like, I'm going to like plan for every possible thing so that I'm not taken by surprise. And I mean, it goes back to this like, safety and security and and it's and I, I still don't know that I fully understand but like the fact that my spleen is undefined and that that's the place where fear lives because actually like I know this about corporate culture I know it's not for me and yeah. there's the conditioned idea that it offers stability and security and so there's yeah. the there's this this whole, I mean you were saying like with an undefined spleen you can hold on to things for so long even though I've been yeah. out of that space for so long there's still a part of me that feels called or not called to it that's not the right word but feels drawn seduced to it. seduced yes. by it <laughs> yes it feels sexy in some way even though I know it's not for me because it's so deeply conditioned that having a nine to five equals stability equals security equals safety yeah and that um, becomes a part of our beliefs and it becomes a part of our programming where it's like, oh, you know, if we don't do it and then it triggers a fear, you already have so much awareness of where, you know, what your core beliefs are or core fears of. Now, can we unravel it 
and reprogram. And that's going to take time. And it's going to take, you know, surrounding the dragon and not, and not be like, I'm going to sit here every day for two hours. I'm going to like rewire all my limited beliefs. Like nothing works like that. We need to live. We need to feel safe. So a lot, I guess, for the completely open space is about, is about learning how can I be safe in myself? Mm. It's a hard question. <laughs> it is a heavy question. But also, you know your truth. You've always known your truth. Even though you didn't know how to get there, you kind of know. How can you always lean on to that? Yeah. And I think one of the things that's been coming up for me also this week is like, it's not knowing, like you were saying, like there's no right or wrong answer. No one's going to punish me for anything. Um, Just yourself sometimes, ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like berating myself. Like, why'd you make yeah. that decision? Um, but I think the trust then is not trusting in the decision. It's trusting that I'll have myself regardless of the outcome. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's trusting that even if things did not turn out how you planned, you have the capacity, you have the ability to cope. It's not about, you know, trusting that everything will just be perfect and living in la-la land and just waiting for life to take you. <laughs> no, because we are an active participant, but it's also trusting, yeah, I'll be able, if shit hits the fan, I'll be able to deal with it. It's going to be painful, probably. It's going to be chaotic, <laughs> but I have friends. I have people that support me. Maybe I don't have to deal with it alone. If it comes to worse, that's what, like, my, what helps me go from, like, ah, planning everything to, like, I cannot control the future. I can only take care of myself right now and take the next step. And there's no right or wrong, which took a very long time to be at ease with. It is practice. It's almost like you're trying these new shoes that you've never worn before. And you're like, it's going to be uncomfortable at first. I'm going to have a lot of doubt and questions. And something that I wanted to call, like, bring out, because you keep mentioning that this is your coping. That's why you're reasoning all those things. It's also your mental energy. It's what you have. It is half coping. It is half, you know, trying to protect yourself, but it's also the mental energy wants to munch on things. It wants uh -huh. to chew on things. So it's not about shutting it off. It's not about saying, do not think about it. How can you balance, you know, the, the script of like always wanting to solve to like, okay, great. This is what's coming. How can I take care? How can you ask the questions about caring for yourselves? tuning to your body as and opposed that to chew on yes Instead, chewing on the future and what's yes. gonna happen chew on how I can care for myself yes wow. instead of chewing on how can I fix it or that that's wrong with myself like give it give it nourishment <laughs> give it something to chew on that is not more anxiety oh my gosh that's so funny I was just I sent a friend the other day this clip it's from happy feet and like the penguins jump off the cliff and the one penguin like is scared to go and then he like yeah. off. he's like hold over and then like jump off and I feel often like I have to like this feels like a bait and switch for my brain but it's so wonderful it's often like the way that I'll make a to-do list I'm in that like go 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 energy but I'll put like meditate on there and then when I actually <laughs> drop in if it's for a longer period of time at a certain point it shifts and I'm no longer just doing it because it's on my to-do list but I've like actually taken a breath and just get to be and this feels similar it's like you know I don't know. It, it reminds me of when I guess that's totally, totally a tangent, but like, <laughs> no, that's like, perfect. Allow my mental energy to do its thing. Like don't try and stop it from feeding work with it. Just instead of feeding it, you know, yes, keep going on the, you know, infinite decision matrix, feed it. How can I care for myself? How yeah. can I, yeah. How can you ground how yourself in the present? Because I think it's so easy to try to plan and cope and think that if we can figure out the answers, then I'll feel less unstable. But yeah. what is the in, <laughs> un, un, instability or the chaos right now? It's not something wrong. It's just like, okay, the energy wants to move there, wants to get whatever insights. I'm not supposed to know what insights it is. I'm just supposed to take care of myself as I'm feeling all these, you know, madness. How can mm -hmm. I ground myself? How can I tune that energy? Like, okay, give it something good to munch on because it's going to want to munch on many things. Like you cannot turn it off. The more you try to, the more you're going to try to, you know, oppress that energy. It's not. Mm -hmm. Let it let it chew on something. But how can it be in service of you right now? Not in solvent, not in, you know, fixing or healing. Like, what does my body need? Do I need to sit in something comfortable? Okay, how can it help me ground in the body? Because just as you were talking, it seems like your body and your mind are oh, they wanting different things. How can you slowly align them? And this is, again, practice. 
there's that recalibration mm. yeah that takes time until we yeah. until it becomes so natural that we don't even think about it anymore but until it gets there it's okay because you weren't there because you were so used to doing something else your programming was running so just give it time as it updates <laughs> yeah yeah i really um this practice of like calling in guides and asking your guide like the that you your guide can't interfere but like if you ask them then they can guide you and yeah. it's really been so powerful just in asking because I, you know, it like gives me the sense of autonomy that I don't feel like I often have. And just being able to sit and like tune in and be like, what is the ask? Like, what is it, you know, when I'm spiraling and it's this and it's that, it's like, well, what is the ask? Like, what is really at the core of this? Like, what is it that I'm looking for in guidance? Or what is it that I'm yeah. looking for, whatever it may be. And so I don't know, when you were speaking, it reminded me of that in like a similar vein of like, you know, what can I give myself for comfort? Like, how can I just like, I think those questions can be so grounding and so powerful because it takes you out of like, what if this, what if that, what if that? And it's like, okay, in this moment, what it, and it's like, oh, that's actually a hard question. Yeah. I need to sit with for a second. Like I need to pause and really think about like, oh, what is it that would make me feel better? Um, yeah. And it's also not bypassing whatever you're feeling, you know, it's, I'm feeling discomfort, I'm feeling all that. How can I hold myself as I try to hold that without trying to force an outcome? Because again, we want to solve, we want to, be, we want to take the discomfort away. But if this is part of the energy that wants to move, how can I let this energy move in a healthy way instead of letting it spiral? Because you're still, when we're, you know, feeding it with anxiety, it's still moving. It's just adding, it's just not in service of us. It's just, you know, it gets even more uncomfortable and more pressure. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. And I'm probably like, I'll send you this recording. So you'll go, you'll be yeah. able to listen to this over and over again. But also yeah. I wanted to talk about um, your question about what does it mean to be a projector to wait mm -hmm. for the invitation and think of it. So your aura naturally is able to, they call it penetrative. It's almost like you can read into the other people very easily. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when something's not working or even through your, 3955, the channel of emoting the acoustic, you can hear if it's their truth or not. You can hear if something's off. Yes. Yeah. So you will be tempted to say like, hey, you're telling me you want this, but I feel like you really don't want it. So the invitation, it's almost like the person giving you consent because it's so tempting to guide and fix and help when we're not invited to it. And then we're not received. And then we become bitter. We're like, well, you asked for advice, but clearly sometimes people wanted to rent. So the invitation is basically like a guideline for what is safe to move your energy, what is safe to, you know, devote yourself or to spend that energy in, you know, and the recognition is part of the invitation or people recognizing and seeing you and are they asking? And it might not be as literal at all times. It might not be like, hey, help me out <laughs> this is what I need right now or I invite you it might not be but I think again sensitizing it you'll notice when somebody's actually open up for you to come guide them versus someone who's just kind of talking saying like I see your skills I think you can do this for me do it but then you're actually not recognized and it doesn't feel for you it doesn't feel good for you to move your energy or guide it just feels something's off you didn't mm -hmm. do it right in another another metaphor that I have when I was trying to understand this like do you know the um, operation toy where you have to yeah. like, so sure, you sure, have yeah. the ability yeah you have the ability but imagine that person is not ready for you it's, it's going to be a zap for you and that person and it's mm -hmm. a way to protect your energy is the invitation there is there recognition mm -hmm. how does that invitation look like you know you it feels like a correct yes let's move that energy it feels you know sometimes physical you can notice when it feels good to move that energy that way mm -hmm. and it comes with trial and error it's okay if you try things and done things where you weren't recognized and you felt bitter as a result of that you're like okay yeah I probably didn't <laughs> there's no judging again there's no right or wrong it's just guidelines and guide was like oh okay that wasn't safe to move my energy or oh okay I wasted my energy guiding people who didn't want to be guided <laughs> Yeah, and guidelines and also just knowing what to be like aware of and what to be just attuned to in that situation or in any situation. That's really, yeah. 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 
in a big part of like you know getting recognition from others it's not really about getting it but just getting comfortable with it is also recognizing ourselves and I think as a projector is the hardest thing because we see through people but we don't see ourselves we're able to guide others but seeing ourselves is like a blind spot it's the hardest thing we can have a lot of self-awareness but when we have tension or we get tangled we might not see what we're able to do so how can we give can ourselves can you the say more, <laughs> like, more I'm, I'm, tell me more like i just yeah there i was um i i'm doing a, a trauma teacher trauma-informed teacher training and i had like a personal one-on-one -on -one session the other day and one of the things that she said to me was like write out a list of like all the things that make you impeccable and i was like it was just crickets. Like it was so yeah. like, I haven't done it because it's so hard for me to like see myself in that yeah. way. I, yeah. Like, so I'm just like, I would love to hear more. Like, what is, what's that about? Like how, how, how do you work with that? Like, is it important to see yourself? Like, is it, yeah. Well, remember, so let's weave the other parts of our design. And like, this is, <laughs> we talked a bit about human design, but like, the structure for anybody listening is not an actual reading, but it has timbits of it because I, I feel like we talked about so many different parts like, okay, let's piece it together. So you're yeah. a triple split. So your process is moving through different energies. So knowing that you're a projector who, you know, seeing ourselves is harder, what would help? Would it be going through different groups of friends? Just ask them like, hey, why, why are you friends with me? <laughs> or maybe there's a different way. Like, what do you appreciate about me? And it's not about fishing for compliments. And I feel like this is a whole other thing we can talk about where it feels very uncomfortable to receive things like that. But it's almost like I'm trying to learn about myself. I'm trying to like recognize my skills and strengths. Like, what do you see that I'm helpful with? And sometimes that reflecting back on us can help us see those parts, can help us like be more comfortable in that recognition and also recognizing ourselves. Again, because we see everything, it's almost like our energy is like going outwards all the time to the people around us that we're not even aware of that, you know, when it come in, it's picked up all these different energies and our open centers also picked up all this thing that it's harder to see ourselves. So having the right support system, people that you trust and ask them that and you're like, I feel uncomfortable. You can be honest, right? Oh, this is so cringy, but I really want to know like what, you know, and then eventually as you practice it, just, you know, let that, let that in your body a practice that I do is like when I started getting compliments I was like oh I can't cringe that was like lock like block it don't get the compliment that was always my default and then a friend of mine's like I'm trying to give you something nice I'm not doing it because it's not true like why can't you receive it like you're also blocking my good like trying to give you something uh, it's like oh right so how can I receive it in a way that feels less cringy and it came with practice where I'm like oh you see this in me thank you okay, how can I hold it in my body? It feels uncomfortable at first, but can I sit with it? Can I let it, you know, just spread through the rest of my body? Does it eventually feel good? It could, it does. Yeah, my reaction was always to be like, oh, blah, blah, but like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, like I stop and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, it's just stopping hard. and like, oh, okay, thank you. I don't need to say anything. I don't need to excuse or prove that I'm worthy of that compliment. Yeah yeah or deflected or yeah, yeah it's the, deflected. like ping pong yeah. like let me send it back to you oh I didn't do it and then yeah. yeah I was grateful I had friends that call me out for it and I'm like oh I didn't know that's what I was doing I thought I was being humble you know <laughs> it's funny the things that came through this year like earlier is like that self-care for me really is like going slow receiving and being okay with receiving and just ease like in the biting and ease and being like okay with ease there's yeah. something in my body that feels like if it feel if you're feeling ease you're unsafe like there's something yeah. that's going to come and you will yeah. have been there's actually so I don't know um how like if you use tarot in your tarot like readings in your practice anyways I have a deck and um the like idea of the fool just keeps coming up like there's this fear of being the fool of like being a fool of being fooled like whatever it may be but it's 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 relaxing that hyper vigilance to invite in ease and what comes up in that fear space is like the fool is like mm -hmm. being okay with like not knowing or being okay with like you know looking silly or being okay with getting it wrong whatever it may be um has been yeah something that like keeps coming up this year for me yeah yeah yeah. and what does it 
bring out, like you mentioned fear, what are the other parts of the full? I don't know that much about tarot. So what does that card represent? Well, it's interesting because it's the beginning. I also don't know that much. So like to preface, but like it's the beginning of the, the journey. So it's like this idea that like you have to be the fool to like enter into the journey of like not knowing and then going through these kind of cyclical stages um, or the cyclical process. Uh, I think it's really beautiful. I think it's like, I think that, you know, even the fool can be like, you know, maybe have negative connotations, but it's that space of like wonder or that space of not knowing or that space of just like awe or, you know, like, being okay with being in that space, the, the space of like hope, you know, like I think it's so magical and beautiful to be able to hope for something. But I also think that like, you know, if you have a lot of trauma, it's hard to hope for things. It's hard to relax that hypervigilance. It's hard. It can be hard to be in a state of ease. Like I've done some yoga nidra before and it's taken into such a deep state of relaxation. And then it, twice it happened at a certain point my body just kind of like jolted awake and I just needed to like shake like I needed to move I felt so panicked because it was like my body realized we became too <laughs> we became too, too relaxed. relaxed and like we need to something's be, gonna come something's gonna come yeah we need to be on alert so I think it's like what you've been saying is it's a practice and it's it's recalibrating and it's I love what you said about you know you don't have to hold it all, but like, what can you hold in this moment? Because I think it often is like, I was talking to a friend the other day and she's like, I need to rest. And you know, it's like, okay, can, can we rest for like five minutes? Like I think putting a time frame around it just to be like, you know, what does it mean to rest an entire day? You know, it's like harder, but just being like, you know, rest for five, rest for a minute, like just sit down for a minute, like set a timer on your phone for one single minute, just to sit and do nothing. Like we don't, you know, the same thing with like, hold it. Like, what does that mean? You don't have to hold everything. Like this one thing, can you just create some space for it? I think is really, it's just a helpful reminder to like yeah. be able to break it down and it to be more digestible and not so overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. So instead of like being a grocery list of all the things we need to fix, all the things we need to hold, it's almost like, okay, this is, it's gonna happen eventually. I always figure it out right now. It's like, am I, do I need to move? If, if, do I feel like a buildup of energy? Sometimes I feel like shaking or dancing or like, you know, putting some music that also helps move energies. Other time I wanna be more still. And also knowing the difference of what you need. How can you honor that? So you can get in tune with yourself there's no good yeah. or bad and it might change every day you know maybe last week this music really helped me dance and I felt amazing and right now I'm just like I don't I'm cranky okay maybe go for a walk maybe just see you know and it's not about fixing that feeling it's almost like okay I'm feeling this I think the the biggest challenge perhaps as you were sharing you know the highs and lows are going to hit you it's going to be a part of your life how can you see this as guiding you not as I'm doing this right or wrong more like okay what insights are you trying to give me right now <laughs> okay I'm being open I'm feeling this I'm I'm in a low didn't mean I made the wrong decision doesn't mean that like I need to fix my way out of it it's like okay low this is where the energy wants to go right now how can I take care of myself maybe Netflix maybe like because a lot of times it's not really about you know journaling making space for that holding that that can be too much that's adding on the pressure that's like adding the expectation of like give me the insight right now it could be as simple as like, maybe you want to meet friends or maybe you want to watch a movie. I'm not talking about bypassing, but it's also like helping you hold until, you know, you deal with that later until, you know, help yourself feel safe first in your body. Because if your body is feeling like, <gasps> like, this is happening, I need to hold it, then it's already in a like an alert stage. What helps you relax into it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I have to spend time thinking about that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah how are you feeling right now we've talked through so much <laughs> um I think it's so ironic right because it's like stop over intellectualizing <laughs> and it's like okay but I'm like literally writing things down <laughs> and to go. um I love what you said like toward, just a minute ago where you're like just knowing I always figure it out and I think it goes back to that self-trust and everything else I mean everything that we've talked about but just really being like always figure it out like I'm here it's okay yeah, you're yeah. Here. it wasn't like the most pleasant thing but you know you're still here yeah and a lot of it I think 
I don't want to generalize, but sometimes our pain, our suffering, you know, can be because we're in our mind, feeling that we're dealing this by ourselves, feeling that we're just like, oh, and thinking that it's wrong for feeling that way. When sometimes the human experience or the way that we are, it's like, yeah, I'm going to feel this. It's fine. It doesn't mean I'm not healed in a part of us, especially if you're in a healing space, it's almost like, how can I help others if I haven't healed enough? And that was a story mm-hmm. I carried on for so many years. I'm like, I'm not healed. And then it's like, actually, I'm imperfect. Nothing's wrong with me. Yes, there are things that I can prove like everyone else. But the less time I spent on worrying about all the things I need to fix, the more time I had to live. And then I was able to show up for other people because I didn't think anything was wrong with me. And it took so many years to program because the healing, when it starts and then we get, oh, we feel so much better. And it just feels like this other thing we have to do. It almost feels like another to-do list. Yeah. And that's what, yeah, I think the beginning when we were talking, it's like, that's where I feel like I'm at the precipice of like coming out of like this 99% of my time spent and focused on like, how can I heal and how can I, and just starting to live again. And for a long time, it felt like I couldn't, like I, I, yeah, I think I needed to go through my Saturn return and my dark night of the soul and everything else. But I do think I'm more on the precipice of, of figuring out, not even figuring out, just like allowing. It's not figuring out. It's not like a mental thing. It's just like allowing. Allowing. And just, yeah, just like being more in the flow of life and not needing to like control everything and not needing to figure everything out and just taking things step by step. Yeah. Um, and one more thing to, to add to it, like your third line energy, the martyr, the person that's going up and down the stairs, seeing what's wrong. Like this is, you're here to find things that are not working. So whatever you try, if you feel like it's a failure, you're like, oh, great. That didn't work. Like this is what you're here to do. And then you innovate because then the next step you take is going to be different. And the people around you gets affected by this. When you start honoring, you're like, oh yeah, this didn't work. And maybe through conversation, you share with someone and then they're like, oh yeah, that's right. And then you know, that helps them figure it out. Mm. You know, that is how your energy is moving. It's not about getting things perfect. There is the sixth line has this desire for perfectionism. It wants things to look a certain way. It wants a partner that is perfect. (laughs) And the third line is almost like, let's try it out. And the third line is also here to like bring bonds. Sometimes if something's not working, it's almost like I'm done, cut it off. And sometimes that's good. It's in servitude of that energy. Other times it's like, how can you renegotiate the bond of whatever relationship, a job, how can I make it work for me? That's the third line energy. It's about improving, innovating, but not from a place of I'm not enough. I'm not good. It's simply like, hey, what's to play around? Yeah, I love that. I think I can get stuck in the things not working or like seeing flaws and things. And then, um, yeah, and it's bleak to, you know, only see negative things and, and things. And I think that the the call to use that to innovate, it becomes like a more of a generative process as opposed to just being like, and then they could have done this better, and then this could have been like this, and then they really shouldn't have done that. Like that kind of that kind of energy and that kind of approach to things, as opposed to like, oh, interesting. Like, um, and I always find in in a in the space of like art or poetry or um anytime anyone's on stage that I have so much generosity and just being like oh it takes so much vulnerability to like stand up and yeah and to to share that vulnerability that um I think if I bringing that type of generosity like that energy feels so much more um yeah it just feels softer and so much better the idea of that yeah like it's a playful energy allow yourself to play when you're in the playground as a kid like were you ever like oh I should have climbed this way that was not perfect form I should have slide you know so many of the things were so conditioned in us out of maybe to help us whatever but it's almost like we take it as as like if we don't do this the right way then there's no other way how can we release that and soften a little bit in ourselves and the idea too that it needs to be like done the right way the first time like allowing for that iteration, allowing for mistakes. And it, it's like the fool again. It's like being okay <laughs> with like getting it wrong, being okay with making mistakes, like being okay with not knowing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like you've known these things. You've always done. It's just resonating with you because somebody else is like, oh yeah, thank you for giving me the permission. Because like, you know, your inner truth is something you've always known. 
it's just like, how can I make space for it to speak to me as opposed to all the other <laughs> energies and distractions and conditionings? Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. This is, You're welcome. Yeah, this is really like, I'm definitely going to re-listen multiple times because I feel <laughs> like I just want to like be able to absorb it. Um, but yeah, there's so many like nuggets here that I'm just like, oh, that's just like, I feel it in my body and it resonates. And I feel like so much of what you said too is like, it just aligns with like a lot of the other messaging that I've been getting throughout this year. It just like all feels very synchronous. And it's, yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's like probably the universe being like, yeah, so listen to it. Like, yeah, yeah. Everything out. <laughs> just live life and put one foot in from the other and like, you're okay. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like you've known all along. Now do it. It's okay to do it. Yeah. A gentle nudge. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And if you have any questions, honestly, just message me or you can like DM me on Instagram for anything okay. like, yeah, because I know that you've taken in so much more questions are probably going to come as we're living because, you know, living is an experiment like there is things are going to come up. So, yeah, open invitation for anything that you have experiment, everything. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. I hope this was, was helpful. So nice. It was so nice. And it was so nice to, oh, it was so nice. Like, thank you for holding the space and like exploring and being so um, like respectful and soft with like me sharing. And yeah, like every, this was so, so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the whole In Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect within, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.